I got a rule, you know, I can judge people in one second uh, if they're, uh, if they got a full set of hair, if they're, they're real fit and they drive a really expensive car, I'm like, oh, I'm suspect right I off the bat. I don't trust them. You know, That's that guy right there. Right here. <laughs> yeah, my Honda fit out there. Full, yeah, he's not, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I was just kidding about that. So. He mentioned those and I was like, Honda fit. I was yeah. like, Dang it. <laughs> Whatever you're saying, I'm not yeah. going to approve. <laughs> well, um, Dr. Solis, thank you so much for, you. for coming on the podcast. I appreciate you uh, driving up from, from Lake Jackson. Appreciate it. For our listeners, can you introduce yourself? Um, tell everybody where you work and what's the new gig that you're uh, yeah, you jumped so, into? Yeah, uh, so Vince Solis, and I'm the new president at Brazosport College. Uh, so I'm from Texas, but uh, spent the last four and a half years in Nevada. So what were you doing in Nevada? Uh, similar situation. You know, I was a the president there at the Western Nevada College and uh, saw this opening here and an opportunity to come back home. So I jumped at the chance and, yeah. uh, you know, worked out. Heck yeah. So um, what part of Texas did you grow up in? I grew up in the valley, a small little community called La Jolla. And not even in La Jolla, I grew up in a, like a little offshoot called Tierra Blanca. So yeah. no stores, no streets, uh, no services. But, uh, you know, that's why I grew up. And that's what I call home to this day. That's yeah. great. You know, he speaks Spanish. You can hear it. Yeah, yeah. 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 He so can't say that answer. same word, so just, well, I just want to point that out. Say what now? Where is your hometown? La Jolla? Tierra Blanca. Yeah, Tierra Blanca. Please, yeah. please say that. Tierra Blanca. Yeah, it doesn't that, sound the same. Is it kind of close? <laughs> I'm close. You're close, Yeah, yeah, yeah my parents yeah. didn't teach me Spanish. Yeah. I, I hold a grudge against them. <laughs> it's, it's, greatest, a, it's the greatest it's gift uh, immigrant parents can give their kids, you know, d- yeah. the, the ability to... To benefit from having m- multiple languages. Absolutely, especially yeah. these days. Oh, yeah, yeah. The world has gotten small. It's shrunk. Technology has disrupted everything. And uh, the more people you can connect with, the more access you're going to have to success points in your life, your career, your goals. So it's really important, yeah. So what made you want to get into the education world, the education system? You know, it's a good question. Um, I'm one of those people that's really blessed to work in a space that I love doing every single day. Uh, you know, I went to college and, uh, you know, I tell people I stayed there ever since. So, uh, you know, I'm a former high school dropout. I'm the youngest of 11. Um, so, you know, those educational opportunities weren't available to us in a lot of different ways. So, you know, when you're young, you do things that you think you know are going to be the best for you. And the reality is that when we're young, we make really dumb mistakes. So one of the things that I did that I regret the most in my life is having dropped out of high school. Uh, When you do that, you put yourself in a cage because you've got real limited opportunities. Uh, There's only so many things you're going to be able to do without a skill set or without education. So I bounced around, you know, job to job, trying to figure this thing we call life out uh, until I ended up uh, working near where my sister was at, the sister that I have here in Houston. And she just kept pushing, you get your GED, get your DED, get your GED. So I did. And then she wouldn't stop. She's like, you got to go to college. You got to go to college. You got to go to college. So funny story on that, John, my, my sister, uh, she, uh, she said, why aren't you signing up for classes at the university? I'm like, man, you know, what am I going to do? You know, I don't know anything about the space and, uh, how do I pay for it? How to do all those things? Well, she took care of, you know, connecting me to the financial aid, uh, director. She, you know, she just made it happen for me. So when people ask me, how'd you get into space? It's, uh, really just to help other people do what I did or what I've been able to do by getting them an education. I yeah. think edu- there's two things that will transform a person's life. And I learned this through a student that we served in our prison education program. We had a lot of students and I'd go visit with the students. Uh, I, I never referred to them as our inmates or, you know, convicts. I always referred to them, you're the students in our classroom. You're just in a different part of the college. So one student told me that uh, he, was in, he was in there for life. He was never going to get out. Uh, he had killed someone. And he told me uh, that the two things that will change a person are religion and an education. And I'm a big believer in that because uh, an education will transform everything about you, your skill sets, what you know, what you can do. Um, it, It takes you places that you never thought you could go. So when I get asked that question, for me, it's all about giving back to a community so that I can also help change the lives of people through an education because especially in this day and age, you got to have skill sets. you got to understand the digital economy uh, so there's a lot that comes without uh, with having an education that you can do without not having one. Wow. That's pretty amazing. You dropped out of high school, and now you're a college freaking president. Like, yeah. that's, that's amazing. Go figure, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it's all the po- testament to the power of education. So what? and your sister and my sister, <laughs> yeah, and my sister. You know, all, all my family. I'm, I'm the youngest of eleven, and they all push. You know, I'll tell you a crazy oh, story. Wow. So youngest. Yeah. yeah. This podcast episode is brought to you by. BCN Supplements. 
Mike and I have teamed up with BCN and we're so excited about it. Now, if you're new to the fitness world or you're just starting to get in, BCN has legitimately everything you're looking for, whether you want healthier hair, skin, um, nails, if you want to get a good pre-workout drink, or if you want a vitamin, BCN has what you need. One of their products I love is their collagen mix. It's legitimately so easy to use. I know you're thinking, why is a guy taking collagen? But it helps with everything, muscle recovery, muscle mass, it helps with your hair, skin elasticity, and you can take it with anything. You can put it in water, you can put it in pancake mix. I take protein pancake mix, so I like to use it in that. Or you can put it in coffee or if you're on the go. Um, just one scoop is all you need, and you're gonna help your hair, your skin, muscle mass, muscle, your joints, everything. Head to bcnsubs.com to place your order today and be sure to use CWJM to receive a whopping 10% off your next purchase. And be sure to check them out on Instagram at BCN Supplements. BCN Supplements, helping build a better you from the inside out. Yeah. The youngest. So, wow. Tell you a funny story. I go through this interview process uh, at Brazosport, and the community has been amazing, uh, and it's been really welcoming. I'm going through this process. There's a lot of pressure when you're going through these interviews for a president because they're very public. They're very open. You know you've got some really difficult competition because everybody is, you know, they're tenured, they're credentials, they've been around the block. And I go through the process, everything works out, and I call my brother. I'm like, man, I got the job. I'm coming back home. You know, we're all excited. And he goes, you know, it's really interesting that you got a job uh, as a college president, the, the first place that I went to school at. So my mm. brother was the first guy in our family to go to college, but I never knew, I was a little kid, I never knew that he went to school at Brazosport College. Wow. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, you know, I could have used that in my interview, you know, so, uh, but uh, it worked <laughs> out, you know, he told me, yeah, thanks for the help, right? He says, uh, yeah, he goes, that's where I went to school. They helped me get set up. He started a business and he was the first person in our family to go to college. And after him, 20 more people went on to get degrees, credentials, certificates, um, but it always starts with that one person who can make it happen. I just, you know, life is funny how my brother started out here and now I'm working at Brazosport as the college uh, president. So it's just, uh, life can throw you these curveballs of, of trying to understand meaning. Um, but yeah, my brother started out here and, uh, I'm glad to, to, to be where he started. Yeah. Brazosport's a, a, in a very unique position because we got these manufacturing facilities, these chemical plants, yeah. um, and that's that's what's helping thrive this local economy, right? Is the people oh, going going there? Yeah. And how is Brazosport keeping up with that kind of technology as technology changes inside these manufacturing environments? What are y'all? I mean, are y'all teaming up with the plants? Sure. What, what, what's that look like? You know, a big part of it is having really great partnerships with the community, and I've been really impressed with what the people, our team members at the college, have been able to do in terms of connecting to these partners, so that we can have a better understanding of what's needed in terms of the training. And then what we can do as an institution to provide the kind of resources through a lot of different ways to make sure that the students are having the best experience in terms of learning what they need to be learning, uh, the skills that they need to have so that when we produce a graduate, it's a high quality graduate. And people say, you need to pick up the students from Brazosport College because they're not only really great individuals, but they're great team members and they learn those skills there at the college. So it's all about having those partnerships, understanding what the needs are and keeping pace with it, John, because a big part of it is understanding where things are changing and how we can adjust our game plan to ensure that we're keeping up with this world we call technology and the, and the digital environment. Yeah, absolutely. And what's the best way to keep up? I mean, what, what keeps you engaged in, in the ever-changing environment to well, allow you to make you know, the adjustments? There's, there's a lot of people with really big brains uh, on our campus, so a big part of it is understanding where they're at. Uh, we, we, I have the benefit of working with the smartest, most educated people in our communities. Uh, so that's a big part of it. The other part of it is I, I tell everybody, be curious about the spaces that we're living in and question everything because there's a lot of information out there. We need to make sure that we're accessing the right kinds of tools to understand what's happening so i read a lot uh i do a lot of uh podcasts in terms of listening to what's out there listen to experts so you have to really stay relevant with what's happening because it's a disruptive space and i think higher education is in a is in a wonky space in terms of trying to figure out where the future's at uh you know i listened to this um, podcast the other day and the speaker was talking about this idea this concept that the most important thing we can teach young people right now is the ability to adapt to change because 
it's not just that we're preparing students for worlds and jobs that don't exist yet. You're going to have to train people to get comfortable retraining and reskilling all the time. And the one thing that we know about adults is they're not real good at change. <laughs> so uh, they love change, but they just want change happening somewhere else. So right. uh, it's, I think those are the kinds of things that are really important. So keeping up with the literature, podcasts, the news. Uh, I'll watch uh, one set of news in the morning, listen to another set of news in the afternoon, just so I can make sure that I'm getting different perspectives. So it's all about balancing the information and trying to figure out uh, how we adjust the, the, the pieces on the board to make the future happen. Yeah. What? You got something? I wanted to get into a little bit of, you know, back when you went to school, um, you know, technology was obviously vastly different. Yeah. Nowadays, we can teach ourselves online. Kids can learn everything through online. YouTube, you can become, you can become a, almost, a, you know, a certified car mechanic on yeah. YouTube, things like that. How is education going to, in, in your mind, where, where do you see education going? Because the, the act of teaching, you know, mathematics there's almost no need to, I don't want to say no need to focus, but I feel like that, um, the old way of doing it, like, you know, doing the equations and, and doing that, I feel like that's morphing now because everything is a worksheet. Like in the real world, you don't need to know the equation. You just need to know how to perform the job. You need to, can you plug the equation into a spreadsheet kind of thing? That's where, like we're going now almost, it, it, but and that's, that's a detriment too, because we're losing yeah. the ability to, to actually critically think, but yeah. where do you see education going in the well, future with to, that? to your last point, John, I think it's really important that we not lose sight of what happens in America, this idea of American exceptionalism in terms of what we teach and what we produce. And America has a fabulous, and I know there's a lot of critics about uh, where the future of education is headed, but America is benefit to not only having really amazing research institutions all the way down to really great K-12 institutions. I know that we see what's in the news and there's always criticisms about what's happening in the space, but if you think about what's happening in the rest of the world, we're just far ahead in terms of our economy, the benefits that we have from living in the richest country in the world, and we've got a really good education educational system. It can always be better. But to this last point that you talked about in terms of the critical thinking, I think that if you think about what's happening in the world, and I'm looking at that uh, globe right behind your desk here, um, everything is being shaped by what people are learning and knowing. And the reason that's important is because the rest of the world has gotten really good at copying ideas that are generated here. And I think that for Americans that live in a free society, the one thing that doesn't change for us even though things are different in terms of the math and the science and the things that go with it, big ideas are still produced here. If you think about the cultural significance and impacts that we have as Americans around the globe, that happens because we live in a society where we can think outside the box. So I think the rest of the country is catching up, to, the rest of the world is catching up to our country in terms of what is being taught with the data, the numbers, the math, the science, the literature, et cetera. But big ideas are as a result of a lot of people coming from all over the world to this country to seek out that American dream, uh, the vision, the hard work, the dedication to make it happen, and more importantly, the freedom to do and to chase and to make things happen for yourself. So I think that big ideas will still be part of the American landscape in terms of leading the way. But the rest of the world is catching up because of what you're talking about, the internet, the information. And I will say this, that there's... There is no limit to the information that can be found on the internet. You can find, I'm amazed at the things that can be found. When I first heard of YouTube, I'm like, who's going to load up videos? I said, this is the craziest idea I've ever heard of. It's yeah. useless. It's never going to do anything. Who's going to spend their time loading videos and so that people can watch them? And lo and behold, I can't live without YouTube now because it teaches us a lot of different things. But what, while we may have access to that information, what teachers do in a real special place is guide the path. You can put a student in front of a computer and give them access to the world's information. It doesn't mean that they're going to learn it. Right. We will still need teachers, teachers in that teaching space to guide the path, to teach us as young people when we're developing how to use that information, how to sort that information, where do we go to find the things that are real? Because where there's a lot of things on the internet, a lot of things as we know on the internet are not you know as they should be or right. are real. So teachers are going to have, think of it like this, you know, our, our system, our educational system has been based on the Socratic method. There's this sage on a stage kind of concept where one person goes and gives the information to the students and the students process it. That's changing. 
I think we're going to see classroom move to more like the guide on the side where the coach is kind of on the on, on the sidelines. So, okay, this is what we need to do. Here's the strategy. Here's the play that we need to execute uh, because the information's there. It's how do we use it. So I think teacher's role will evolve just like education. But the information, because it's available, will also take different ways in terms of how we learn. And I think it's really important to keep in mind that individualized instruction is not the same as personalized instruction. So there's a lot happening in the space. Who knows where we're going to be in 100 years, but... Uh, the, I think the one constant is change and adaptability. That's yeah. what we need to be teaching. I think the other thing that's really important that we teach our, our, our young people is networking. I think networking and the ability to connect to other people because the world has shrunk overnight over the last 20 years with technology, we need to have these networks in place to be able to reach the goals and the dreams that we have because you could have this podcast going on here, but there could be a designer for your website in India and someone who's creating the content in uh, Brazil and someone who's making it all happen with the design in LA. And then you guys are the hosts here and all of it can happen seamlessly behind the scenes. So that piece to networking will be really critical. I think that it'll be just as important as the curriculum in whatever area students are learning. Yeah. Do you think we're, um, with going to the digital age, Mike probably gets tired of me t talking about it, that, but I feel like we're losing the ability to, to learn how to or manually do stuff. Um, you know, like my dad, um, I'm sure you in your case, and the, the generation before us can just get stuff done. They can do things. Whereas um, I feel like the generation, I feel like our generation, we're right at the cusp. Like we're, we... We grew up doing manual things, fixing stuff with our hands, but we also grew up in the internet age. Mm -hmm. But the generation behind us, they're more theory thinkers in the school system. Like they, they, they've been taught theory, but they haven't really done a whole lot because they, the, of the screen time, because of what the internet does. What are your thoughts on that? Like how do we balance that? Like being able to actually do stuff and everyone wanting to stay more towards the digital era. Well, I think that part of it is uh, the technology is so infused with young people that, you know, we, we kind of hit it on the back end. You know, so we didn't, we weren't born into it. All you have to do is watch a two-year-old play with a phone and they understand the mechanics behind it. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're driven to it. You know, the, these, these devices are stitched into their hands and now they're talking about, you know, uh, the glasses with the technology and the dental implants with the phone and just crazy stuff. You know, if you think about what's happening with brain links so that people can keep up with the AI, <laughs> these <laughs> things are, are yeah. revolutionary in, in its concepts. But in terms of the question of how do we connect people to doing things, I think it's, it's, a, uh, it's a big societal problem that we're going to be facing in the future because we are gearing up to where society is always going to have different levels of, of people in it in terms of who's doing what. Some people are going to have these really high-paying jobs and other folks are not going to have it. So there's a, there's a mix of things that need to be done. But less and less, one of the things that we see happening is that less people want to do things that require physical labor. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you're a two-year-old, so if you think about it, when I was a kid, they'd ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? You want to be a police officer. You want to be a teacher, right? And then that evolves. What do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer, right? So there was these concepts that were put in, you know, things started evolving. Now you ask a kid, hey, what are you going to do when you grow up? A YouTuber. They're going to be a YouTuber. Yeah. That's exactly right. I was talking to my niece. She was six years old at the time. And I was talking. She said that she was going to have a YouTube channel. She didn't understand it. And she says, but you need to buy me merch, Uncle Vince. And I'm like, <laughs> I said, I said, what, I said what, is, what is merch? And she's like, I don't know. But I know I need it. I'm like, okay. So those are the kinds of things shaping the environment. But I will say this. We think about the things in terms of manual physical labor because they exist today. That may not be the case tomorrow. I think that for a person in today's digital age and tomorrow's digital world, if you're not into the things that are happening in the digital space, it's like being illiterate 200 years ago. Mm. You just don't have access to that knowledge. You don't have access to that freedom. You don't have access to the skill sets that are taking place. Think of, uh, have you heard of this thing called swarm technologies? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So swarm technologies are an emerging field in the digital space that allow for large decisions or really important decisions to be made with the input of a lot of people. So right now the job doesn't exist, but let's think about what happens tomorrow. So you've got automated vehicles. Everybody talks about the self-driving cars and where that's headed. These self-driving vehicles have to make decisions, right? So 
a child or uh, a lady walks out in front of the vehicle, just going the child, the car has to make a decision about do I hit the car, do I hit the lady, or do I veer off the street and hit other people? So the car doesn't have the capacity to do that on their own because it's an algorithm, it's a machine, it's driven by artificial technology. And the way that the systems are placed into these vehicles about who makes the decision, those are community-based standards and they got to feed into it, right? So when you talk about the job piece, I mean, think about it. Your job is to provide community uh, morals and community feedback and those kinds of things so that that vehicle can make that kind of decision. But the swarm technologies take information from a lot of different places and make calculated decisions about what's going to happen. So a couple of years ago, they put this to the test and they took a lot of expert opinions about a sporting event. It was the Kentucky Derby. They took that, and individually, most people are not going to be able to tell you which three horses are going to win, right? right? But the swarm technologies, because it takes input from all of these people and makes the decisions, it calculated which horse was going to win the Kentucky Derby. So yeah. these swarm technologies, I think, are going to become more prevalent, along with a million other things that are happening. We talked earlier about blockchain technology. I think that blockchain technology is going to revolutionize not only things like legal systems, medicine, higher education, education in general, because now you can keep track of everything on an open ledger. Uh, it removes the middle component in terms of transactions. So if you're doing with business with somebody in, I don't know, Europe, there's no government that you need in between those two spaces. You can make things happen between you and that individual on a ledger that everybody agrees on. And some was, somebody was asking this engineer that I was sitting there, fortunate enough to have listened to, uh, and I don't know how true this is, but this was the way he presented it. He said, they asked him, uh, well, what if somebody cracks the code? And he kind of chuckled and he said, blockchains is infallible in terms of that piece, uh, which I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, everything can change with technology, but he says, it'll take the energy of two suns burning for eternity <laughs> to be able to crack that code yeah. um, but that's right now tomorrow because of quantum computing uh, quantum computing that may change so uh, there's just a lot of things that are happening in the space that i think we need to be thinking about the one that's really trippy is you heard of a company called Dreamcatcher? no so they're figuring out ways of transmitting what's in your brain when you're having dreams so that you can play them back oh i read that on reddit it's crazy, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. Technology is still in its infancies, but you know, we're going into places that uh, you know uh, we we haven't really explored what this is going to do to humanity, and keeping up with it is a is a challenge. Absolutely, sounds like a Black Mirror episode. Oh right? yeah, it's crazy, right? <laughs> Have you seen yeah. Black Mirror? I haven't, but I've heard of it. You need I'm to watch every episode because everything you're talking about is like yeah. it's going that way. Yeah. They predicted on these episodes, yeah. and I think you know. When you think about things like social media, you know, uh, it, everything has its perils. Social media is a great tool for getting the word out. This is a format to it. We can get information in the hands of individuals, but it can also do a lot of different things that are disruptive. So it's really about figuring out the space and how do we educate people so that they can understand how to be successful and how to thrive in these environments because there will be large segments of society that don't have the skill sets. When people say, you know, well, we're, you know, where are the jobs at? Where the jobs are and where they're going to be, the high-paying jobs are the ones that require advanced skill sets. Right. You're not going to be able to, you know, in my case, like drop out of school and say, I'm going to make some kind of living. I mean... I want to be the, a college president. Yeah. <laughs> you know, those are going to be the exception, not the rule. For the masses, and education is still the way forward. It's still the quickest way to change your life in terms of what you can do um, uh, with the skill sets that you have and you're not going to learn those you know now some people will there are some people that teach themselves coding yeah. but for the masses it, you, you know they talk about uh, well we're going to turn everybody into coders who doesn't have a job i don't know man i mean i've taken a couple of classes and i'm like I, this is for the birds i don't want to do it you, you <laughs> have to be highly motivated to do Absolutely. you're learning a language try learning finnish or chinese or mandarin or japanese or spanish or whatever. right now the older you get the harder that becomes you know yeah. the filters in our brain just you know they close over the time so learning new languages like coding the best coders are the ones that grow up doing it mm -hmm. that's just kind of how it works so the idea that everybody's going to become a coder is uh probably not going to happen yeah so how do you how do you evolve then? So as, as a college, you have these structures that have been around forever. You have prerequisite curriculums, all this yeah. stuff. But this, like we were talking about, this world is ever changing. And at what point do you stop and say, "All right, we need to teach this," but kind of not worry that you know a year from now that curriculum can completely change, and then you know these prerequisites that you set and, and you said yeah. you need to do this to have this degree. 
then the classes are kind of irrelevant after a while. Like, how do you even build a new structure when it just it's we're changing so fast? So a big part of it is is planning as far out as you can. And the challenge has been. I remember when I was doing uh, higher ed thirty years ago, I'd sit in these meetings as a young pup trying to figure things out, and they were planning ten years out in a strategic plan. You know, and you're kind of like, oh, I then kind of went down to seven and to five and to three just because everything is so disruptive. But if you think about the Chinese approach to thinking long term, they think about it 10,000 years out. Wow. And the idea behind it is how do you how do you wrap your brain around the idea that we have to manage constant change, which is one item, but it's also mind bending in its speed. It's not just that it's happening all the time. I, I mean, I'll give you an example. I remember we worked on this project where we brought in our faculty, you know, and, and I've always really been blessed to have amazing teachers. Uh, you know, teachers have always been my heroes because they changed my my future, uh, my life. So I, I sit down and bring them in. We're talking about what do we need? And they're talking about these smart boards. Oh, these smart boards, and we, we're all talking about this, what's going to happen, and we go through the process of remodeling this entire facility. It took about 19, 20 months. It was a real large project. And by the time we were done with it, they're like, yeah, these are outdated. You know, we got them in. Now we got these other tools. So it's about keeping, you know, the finger on the pulse. You have to make sure that you give uh, teachers and faculty the ability to think creatively, incentivize the process. Because a lot of times we ask people, hey, John, I need you guys to do ABC. And like, man, I'm busy with everything else. So how do you incentivize these processes for the people with the big brains in the room that are going to make things happen? It's, and the other thing is you got to create environments where people question everything. I'm a big believer that you, I've got this concept called the challenge flag. You throw the challenge flag, everything stops in terms of the discussion. We dig up the data and figure out how we're going to make a decision from there. The loser of that, and there's always going to be a winner and a loser, but the loser just has to bring snacks for the next meeting. That way you keep it lively, you keep it fun. No one gets upset or hurt that we're questioning something that John said or that I said or that you said. It's all about the ability to say, let's sit down and question things so that we can get to a better decision about the future. I want to piggyback off something Mike was talking yeah. about. Um, if I'm going to school to be a doctor or I'm going to school to, for, to be a teacher, I don't give a crap about PE. I don't, I don't care about, I don't want to learn about history. So on those same thing on that same line that he was talking about. Are we going to get to a point where if I want to go to school to be a doctor or an education profession, can I just learn that and, and skip the first two years that I, that's not needed? Like, can we get to that point? Are we ever going to get to that point? Cause what it seems like to, to the, to us, there's pain for these colleges. Like it's just a money grab. I'm, I'm paying for, you know, to learn math when I really just want to be my doctor or, Something sure. like that, you know. Yeah, so here's where I think, th I think there's going to be the inverse of that. And I'm going to tell you why, uh, John, because I think that going back to those big ideas, when you get focused on what you want to do, then you're focused on this piece, right? And you're moving forward lockstep in that direction. When you take that philosophy class, when you take that English class and you have to read that book, uh, you know, I'll give you a good example. I was talking to some of the students in our prison education program uh, at my previous institution, and one of the instructors had asked me to come in to talk about uh, the novel Bless Me Ultima. And uh, part of it was that the students had questions about, I just don't understand the cultural aspect of it. So we had these long discussions about it. And my point being is that when you have these classes that people think, well, I don't need this philosophy class. I don't need this English class. I don't need this math class. I don't need these. You get to do a couple of different things. One, you expand your horizons in terms of developing big ideas, because I, I still believe in that concept that the big concepts, the big ideas, the things that will shape the future are going to come out of the liberal arts. The other things that happen uh, in those spaces is you connect. You connect to the world. You connect to people. You connect to developing people skills that sometimes when you get in this area, so for example, engineers, you're going to go into engineers. Think of what the stereotypical engineer person is going to be. They're good at math. They're very focused. You're looking for an archetype, right? But if you're not in the philosophy class, you're never going to meet Mike. You know, the guy with the cool hair, you know, <laughs> he's in the band. <laughs> the you know, he's going to take you to the best parties, you know. And you get to develop <laughs> these social skills and these networks that will then help you be really good at this other piece. So it's a balance. you got to learn the skill sets that you need in your trade. But you have you got to have the ability to connect to the world uh, uh, in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I, I agree with you. But then again, I, 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 I that was a great point. Like you, you, that was a good you, point. you stumped me. But then a, there's a piece of me that that disagrees because, and, and I don't have a good reason. I just well, do you think 
like with social media, it is making people a lot more social, but kind of in a different way. I guess not physically, but on the internet, they're becoming a little more social. Do you think that's catching that element? I think it's different because if we're in a room together and like here and we have a real heated disagreement, we will have boundaries and still stay focused on getting to where we're at because of the physical space. Yeah. It's real easy for me to be 10 feet tall and 500 pounds and bulletproof behind the screen. When I'm sitting here in front of John, in front of Mike, that changes the dynamic. So I think that social media has a space in terms of being exposed to the world's concepts and ideas. But I think that there's said a lot to there's a lot to be said about the humanity of connecting to one another. Uh, you know, the the big problems that we have to solve: climate change, the economy, uh, work, the future. We do it by working together. We do it by working collectively. And we do it by sharing these ideas in spaces that sometimes, you know, the, the internet and social media don't allow for. So there's a lot of different ways to get the information and there's a lot of ways to apply that information. So I think part of what happens in, in why there's that, that, that perspective in a lot of areas, uh, John and Mike, is because you go to school and a lot of times students are getting racked with student loans. They're having to pay these items. You know, we got to get to a space where we figure out those pieces uh, yeah. because if we can do that, then we can streamline the process. I got asked a question once about what I thought about free education. And I said, you know, I said, you, you probably may not like my message from a, a, a college president's perspective. Well, I think everybody should have that access and everybody should have the ability to get those skills. You know, academia has a dirty secret, John, and that a lot of people that come to our doors nationally don't succeed. You know, I think that, you know, if you think about what the best colleges do, you know, Brazos Sport College being one of these exemplary schools, you've got your students graduating at 40, 42 percent, right? What happens to the rest of the students, right? Then you got uh, institutions that are maybe at 5% graduation rates. How can you as a taxpayer, you're working hard in your field as an engineer, Mike, you're doing all this other work on the side, doing everything that you're doing in your regular jobs, you're paying taxes. And then you read in the, oh, you know what, this, this institution of higher education out there has a graduation rate of 11%. Mm -hmm. So when people ask me that, I'm like, look, I'm willing to th go all in on that, but we need to put in requirements like, okay, we'll pay for your education, but you got you to gotta have at least a 2.0 to get through this. You know, you right. got to get to what you're doing from here, get into there so you can become a productive member in society. But I think that, you know, because I said higher education and education in general, they're not perfect, but they, they, they offer opportunities for those that take advantage of them to, to, to work towards the things that they want to accomplish in life. Uh, on your, on the, on the cost point, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Are we ever going to be able to solve the rising cost of, of college tuition? Um, it's getting to the point where yeah. people, when they do graduate, I think I, I read an article a few weeks back that uh, students who graduated in, in, you know, during 2020 and 2021 with four year bachelor's degrees, they were waiting up to six to 12 months, even before they landed a, a minimum paying job. And these are students that graduated with engineering degrees, yeah. you, know, you know, respectable degrees. And then they're carrying this high, you know, tuition costs, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yep. How do we solve that? How do we make college more affordable for, for everyone and not just a certain amount of people? Well, I think a big part of it is educating the customer. And when you're 18 years old and somebody tells you, it, when I went to school, this is what they did. It They're like, here, you got this $10,000 student loan available for this semester. Go ahead and take it out. You just pay it back when you're done. And there was a big push from the industry to wine and dine your, uh, the, the people that were you know on the front line of offering those loans. Thankfully, those things have changed. And now borrowers have the opportunity to kind of take out what they need so that they can make sure they make informed decisions. The challenge with that is that if you're a poor kid trying to make it through the process and somebody says, John, Mike, hey, look, here's a loan here for you, $10,000. It'll help you pay for everything else you got going on. It's really tempting to not take that if you have no other resources. So I think that for the purposes of how we democratize education, we're going to have to figure out some of these larger, bigger problems that are way above my pay grade in terms of what we do nationally. But in, at, at an at a institutional level, it's about keeping costs down as best as you can, having great community partnerships so that you can offer scholarships. A lot of things that students that I see all the time is we have scholarships. Uh, 
what do they got to do to get them, make that process easier? And the other thing is students understanding that, hey, if I've set a little time and invest in myself, write a couple of applications out, there's a high likelihood I can get a scholarship to help offset these costs. Yeah. So it's a complicated question right? because the only thing that has outpaced higher education in terms of cost in the national economy is healthcare. Higher education is right there with it, and that's that's an issue that we're going to have to solve moving forward because at some point people will decide, I've got all this information here, let me work my way through it and not incur those debts so I can develop the skill sets. You see a lot of people propo being proponents of that. My only thing with that is that it's not what's going to happen with the masses. It'll happen for select few individuals that have the tenacity, the desire, the abilities to do that on their own, and you'll see more and more of it. But for the masses, it's still a college is the best way to get to where you need to go. You need that education, that skill set. Now, I think the other thing that's different, going back to your earlier point about the types of jobs, when you think about going to college or university, people think about, well, let me go and study four years to become, you know, fill in the blank, versus you can go study welding for a year and you're going to make bank, plumbing. Mm -hmm. uh, the there are some things that I think are more future-proof than other in terms of careers. The things right now that require a lot of finite uh, mechanics in your fingers and your hands, machines haven't gotten really good at that. Machines are really good at repetitive things, taking it from here to here, putting the widget in another place. But the kinds of things that you need to do in terms of uh, uh, dexterity and the jobs that require physical labor, they're going to pay really well. They've got really great benefits and you can get in and out of that uh, degree component of that certificate piece and move into a high paying job. So right. there's something there for everybody. What's important is to get into those skill sets because the way the economy is evolving and will continue to evolve, you cannot be left out in the cold without a skill set of some kind. Absolutely. And Brasport does a pretty good job of that. Um, training for trades. Oh yeah. Y'all, I think y'all have done pretty well. Like y'all continue to add programs. Is there anything else that y'all plan on adding in the future? I know y'all have welding and, uh, what is it? HVAC. We got all welding, those essential HVAC, things. We got automotive. We've got all the programs in the trades. We've got the things that with the partnerships in the community with the, uh, chemical petrol business, we're going to go through a process of uh, deeper strategic planning and working through those pieces and trying to figure out where those items are going to be at, uh, because it's about keeping relevant. You got to really stay relevant with not just your curriculum, but your programs so you know it's about thinking through that process so having been here two weeks uh, it's a great question but uh, <laughs> yeah, may, well, yeah what are you doing right now it, yeah, maybe on. we can respond <laughs> in uh, you know uh, a couple of months as we plan those processes out and think about well wh where is the future you know what are we going to continue to do you know there's programs that are designed to help people uh, access you know education one of them that we have going to to john's question about um uh, uh, how do you solve that problem on on a university scale for the cost? But a dual enrollment program, if you're a parent out there listening to these uh, kinds of podcasts or these kinds of, of, of information lines that go out into the space, look at uh, dual enrollment programs in your local area. For us, Brazosport College would be the place I recommend because you put a student in there, it costs the parents nothing. We've got really great partnerships with our K-12 partners. So we connect our faculty to the students while they're in high school. They're earning credentials, they're earning degrees, they're earning credits, and that doesn't cost the student or the parents anything that's a big plus to that the other thing is their success rates are almost 90 percent mm. which is phenomenal and part of it is you know i'm a big believer that anybody comes to our doors has the capacity to make it happen now whether they've got the time the commitment the you know focus not being distracted by a million different things those high school students do really well because they're focused on high school that's kind of their job they they go to school for a living uh, so they do really well but it doesn't cost the parents uh it's it's a nominal fee and it eliminates almost two years of that yeah. expense. So there's things that we need to continue to work on that. I think the other thing that it does is that that opens up the ball, the, 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 the ball game for everybody. Because if I don't have to worry about where I'm going to pay for it, then somebody else is covering the bill. I can go to those classes. I can take those credits. Versus I graduate, I'm like, okay, mom and dad don't have access. They don't have the money. Uh, how do I do this? So you go work. And once you go work and you start making money, it's hard to pull that back and say, let me stop doing this and earning some 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 cheddar and let me go to the college. It's just, yeah. it, it doesn't work that way for most people. COVID has presented um, some unique challenges to, to every industry across the United States and the yeah. world. Um, with with education specifically, um, you know, we a, a lot of it's gone online. So there's a lot of talk of more more schools being 100% online 
um, and, and students who were initially going to in-person now switching to online, but the cost haven't changed to reflect online learning versus in-person learning. Is that, yeah. uh, will that be addressed by universities? Well, I, I, you know, there's a lot of, there's a b- bunch of in-student fees and student services yeah. that you have to pay when you go to in-person class versus yeah. online. You know, this is, this is the question of the day. And I can tell you this, that when people talk about, well, let's switch to online, there's a couple of things that happen. One, it's this idea, this concept that we're all in the same storm, but we're all not in the same boat. I may be in a rowboat, you're in a yacht, you're going to, you're going to fare this storm a lot different than someone who doesn't have the resources ironically when you switch to online the costs go through the roof Mm -hmm. providing online education is a lot more expensive than providing traditional face-to-face because of all the things that are needed to make it happen you need technology you need the resources you need the bandwidth you need the infrastructure to get there the other thing that happens with it i'll give you a great example i was teaching class last semester and uh, every semester i teach especially during covid and and i stayed face to face for a lot of different reasons one i wanted to make sure that my students had access to an instructor if they wanted it live but the other thing is i'm a big believer in that you lead by example so i'm not going to ask any of our teachers to do something in a classroom that i'm not willing to do so it was covid we're going through that and i had a really interesting discussion my first day with our students and i said hey guys look i'm willing to do whatever you guys want to do if you want to stay in person we'll stay in person if you want to go remote we'll go remote you tell me whatever you're most comfortable i'll accommodate we'll make that happen all of them 100 percent, said no we stay in person i'm thinking man vince you're a great teacher these guys love you and that's why they want to stay in person with you and i dig deeper into that and one of the students says i live at home with my grandma i got two brothers and sisters we got one computer and we live in an apartment i don't have a quiet space i need to be here had nothing to do with the teacher, right? Obviously, we want it to be about us in terms of uh, we want him to have a great experience. But his focus was, I don't even have a space to make this happen, so I got to be here. Another student told me something really interesting because we had a guest speaker come in, and I made all the students keep their cameras on. And I learned through this process, and I was a little bit you know, uh, embarrassed with myself because the student came and saw me after class. He said, Doc, he goes, I, I don't want to show my where I live on camera. I said, okay, that's understandable. I said, you know, uh, we'll work through it. Let's get you a filter. Let's get you a background so that you can put it on. He goes, Doc, I've tried. He goes, I don't have the machine that will get me the speed that can run it without crashing. I said, okay, let's go get you a computer, right? So you learn through this process of how we work with our students, but to the question of what does online education do, it it just increases our costs because there's so much that goes with it. And and I will say that there's things happening in that space that are are mind-blowing in terms of what we can learn through data and metrics and how we can better serve students. But all of those things cost money. Yeah. What? What's? Can you give maybe the the biggest factor of online? Because the assumption is online is cheaper. No. Um, no what? No. What's the biggest? I mean, we're talking server, it's hosting. server, infrastructure, cloud. You need. Here's the deal. So back in the day when 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 I teach in person, right? So I teach in person. I'm not me personally. This is me just because I'm old school and I'm 100 years old, and I, it's just I'm not connected to the world the way you're connected to the world digitally. So I prefer that one-on-one space with my students in terms of being live, right? But I may have a, a desire to teach online. Where do I start, right? So how do I get the concepts in my brain about a particular subject to the students in a way that's engaging, that's dynamic, that creates really great questions and discussion? Now it's not just about the teacher. Now you need instructional designers. Mm. You need people that are really, really good with the technology that can set up a really slick class yeah. so that they can take this old guy's content and put it into an area that's going to say, man, this is really fresh and hip and it's slick and I really enjoy taking it. Because if you ask me to do it, yeah, I'll set it up, but it's going to be the most boring thing in the world, right? <laughs> yeah. It's not the same thing. So you not only have the infrastructure costs, now you got to have people that specialize in these skill sets. It's like if somebody came to me and said, Vince, I need you to put up a website. I'm not going to be able to do it, but I can hire someone with the skill sets to do it. Well, the same thing is working in that. Now we hire these instructional designers that can help create really great content because teaching in person is not the same as teaching online. Some people do it really, really well, and they've got it down. Other people struggle with it, but 
Uh, just because they struggle in the online space doesn't mean that they're not really exceptional teachers. So for us, it's about providing the support to our instructors, making sure that they have everything that they need to deliver really good content. Uh, and then for the students is what can we do for you? Do you need a laptop? Do you need something that we can get you? Do you need an iPad? Do you have the book, right? So right. books, when I took them, everybody walked around with a 200 pound backpack. Those days are gone. <laughs> Digital yeah. links, you know, we've got open educational resources. Some classes have no cost for the books, you know, class I had uh, last semester was a $25 link, but it did everything. It wasn't just a link for the content. It had test banks. It had all the questions. It had resources for the student, had videos. It, you know, so it's about keeping up with that. And when these content and these, you know how much it takes to, to edit a video, right? Absolutely. Imagine editing a digital textbook. Yeah. Those things cost money. So it's a misnomer in terms of uh, online education is, is more expensive okay. to deliver. Okay. I wish we saw that though, man, because we, we go to universities currently yeah. online um, and it looks like no, no efforts put in. We have like old YouTube links that are uh, look that are from the eighties that you can look on. You can go look on them yeah. <laughs> on YouTube. Like yeah. they're they're not specific to the college. And then uh, we we just uh, what do we attach the links to our Word documents and they yeah. grade it and and, and some yeah. some professors are really great um, yeah, on the online. They're, yeah. they're superb. We send an email. Mm -hmm. They answer and they, they, they provide really good information. And then some, you send an email and you don't hear any, so, so, anything. From that's them. the bad part. The so what I always tell folks that we're working in the space is, okay, so if you send me an email, if I send you an email, I'm waiting for a response because of ABC, right? So right. if I expect that of my students, when I send them something, I expect them to respond, right? right? So I need to provide the same kind of response to our students because if you don't respond to a student in today's space right away, for, for somebody my age, it may be like, yeah, cool, wait three days and send them a response. Not for today's students. They're like, what's wrong with this guy? I mean, he hasn't <laughs> sent them a text. I sent them this. I mean, he's not responding. I sent them this email. You know, they feel if, if, if you leave it to them, they're going to fill their own, their own ideas with what's happening in the class. So provide the information in a timely manner. Give them feedback. Give students the kind of feedback that they that they need to be successful in the class. Where are your assignments? What's going on? I, you know, I'll tell you a funny story. Last semester, uh, where we start out the class, and there was a couple of students who were concerned about how much reading they had to do to be successful in the class. I'm like, I didn't write the, you know, I didn't write the, I didn't write the curriculum, but we got to get through it. So it was really funny because they go and and they uh, they complain to their advisor that you know the psych teacher just gave them too much work. It was too much to read, and you know, so that advisor calls me. You know, has this meeting. I said, look, I said I can't change the book. You know, they got to read. This is what college is about. We got, but we'll get through it. So the next class, one of the kids says, he goes, well, yeah, I talked to my advisor, and if this doesn't change, I'm going to the president. And talked about this. I'm like, yeah. So knock yourself out. I said, I'll see you there. You know, he wasn't aware that I was the president teaching the class, but he never showed up. But uh, I was looking forward to him coming to my office to complain about the class. So, um, you know, it's about keeping up with what's going on in the space and and working through the things. But you got to be responsive to the students because students are paying for the class. They are paying for the experience. And, you know, I, I, I would hold Sunday sessions with my students live. I'm like, okay, look, this is not a mandatory thing, but if you want to come and learn about the chapter and the chapter quiz, let's Zoom from four to six and we can just fire off questions. That's great. Every Sunday we would do that. Not everybody would show up, but the ones that did would benefit from that. So you got to go the extra mile in terms of connecting to students in the places that they live. And by that, it's in the spaces. You know, How do you connect them with their emails, with their, with their feedback, with the process that they get? Uh, you know, life happens and you got to be responsive to those things with those students. Yeah. I know you're you're two weeks you're you're two weeks into your new Today, gig, right? Yeah, yeah two <laughs> weeks into it. Um, but has Brazos Port experienced teacher shortages uh, due to COVID? Um, is there a staff shortage? What is that looking like? Has it it's how not, much has it impacted? Yeah, COVID has has upended a lot of different things everywhere. So I'm still trying to learn the ins and outs of what's happening there. But our team members are being impacted. You know, the Omicron variant is is rampant. It's very contagious. Uh, you know, people are having to stay in and out. The ones that are here that manage to stay uh, are having to pick up the slack. So it, it's a pressure that's built all the way around. So our plans right now are to continue moving forward as is in person. Uh, but we're going to monitor this real closely because the students come back next week and with more people on campus, we're expecting to see an increase in those numbers and we're going to adjust our game plan based on what's happening. So 
uh, it's complicated. COVID, there isn't a playbook for COVID. Right. You know, we've learned a lot of things over the last couple of years, but uh, every it, it's such a fluid, dynamic environment that uh, it changes all the time. So I tell our folks, look, stand by, be ready. If we have to transition, we will. We'll get you the, the support that's needed, uh, but we just got to have plans in place to make sure that, uh, that we can do it. If I had told teachers two and a half years ago, hey, we're all going to go online. They would have strung me out. They're like, no, we're not going to do it. I refuse to do it. Not going to happen. You can't make me do it. And now I'm not coming back. Yeah. yeah. You know, so <laughs> it's, it's kind of one of these, these spaces that we got to figure out. Uh, because I think the other thing that's really um, that we need to be thinking about for tomorrow's world is what's happening with the world of work. You know, how, how do we create flexibility? Because, you know, remote work has changed us a lot. Look at where we're at. We're in your house, right? You right. know, we're doing this thing in a very different space. So uh, a lot of people have learned that you can do a lot of different things from home. Some things you can and some things you can't. So we're going to have to figure out those spaces moving forward because a young person coming in, they got a lot of different options, especially if they got skills. Right. They got skills. They're like, I don't need to work here. I can go work from home. You know, so it's going to be about figuring out those spaces across the board. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess what I can take from that is Brad's support is good. The, the teachers, we have enough teachers to teach. Yeah, the students absolutely. Right We've now. got really exceptional teachers. The thing about Brad's sports is this, we not only have really exceptional programs and not just because I've been there two weeks, but I've been to the labs. I've talked to the teachers. Uh, they're phenomenal. I mean, I'm really in a blessed position. I've got some really, really high-powered, high-level teachers working in environments that have a lot of resources to provide to students in terms of the kinds of labs that we have, the kinds of programs that we have, the kinds of partnerships to the industry that we have. So, and you do it all in a personalized setting. Yeah. In a personalized setting, you can. I have an open door policy, John. And you can come talk to me any time of the day, as long as I'm in, not in a meeting. You're a, a student, a parent, a teacher, a team member. Doc, I got an issue going on. What can you help me with? You know, and if you call, I got a 24-hour return call policy because I keep a wonky schedule, but I make sure I tell the parents, how late can I call that house? If I call at 930, hey, what's going on? How can I help you with? Anybody can call me because I want to make sure that we remove any kind of barrier that is impeding success. So you're not going to get that at most places. So it, I know that there's a lot of opportunities for people to take classes, but uh, our commitment at Brazosport College is personalized instruction with amazing teachers and really great team members, team members that are there that are there to help you be successful in those processes. So uh, from the time you walk in the door to the time that you take your classes, we're committed to your success. That's great. Another thing that's that that COVID has impacted is the the young children. Um, depending on who you're listening to and, and what you're reading, you read that um, they've it, it's it's hurt their development by two years. Yeah, uh, absolutely. They're so far behind. Yeah. How do you see that playing out by the time they get to you know K through twelve or, or well. I think it, obviously this has impacted a lot of different people, but going back to that concept, if you, if the students have resources, you know, mom and dad are educated, they can then support that child through, you know, tutoring or catching up with homework, understanding how to navigate the system. I think the ones that are going to be impacted the most are going to be first generation students, uh, children of immigrants, uh, minority students, uh, because they don't have in a lot of instances, the way to navigate the process. You know, when you think about, uh, students that are in a space where the only meal that they're going to get is in a physical facility. I mean, if you're hungry, you're, everything else gets disrupted. You know, learning kind of takes a back seat. So I think that we are going to have to figure out what we do with these two lost years. Uh, and teachers across the spectrum, K-12, higher ed, have really stepped up. They've done their more than their part to make sure that our kids are being educated. But it's just a really difficult space. We've been isolated. We have tried to do what we can overnight by going remote. Like I said, to deliver a really good remote class, it takes a lot of planning. It takes yeah. a lot of coordination. you got to design this thing. For, and then we're asking teachers to do it overnight. Uh, the other thing is this. You send teachers home. Teachers have families. Teachers have family. I take my niece, for example. I don't know how she does it. She's a high school counselor. When she was going remote, and I called her, how are you guys doing? What's going on? You know, and the kids are in the background. So she's not only having a focus on keeping her job going as uh, someone working in K-12, she's got to keep the family going, you know? So 
this hasn't been easy for our teachers. So anybody who's listening to this podcast, is thank a teacher, not only for what they have done uh, through this process, but what they're doing for your children. Uh, if you've got a professor at any of our institutions throughout the state, uh, particularly at Brazosport College, uh, thank your instructors for making it happen during just a really, really difficult time. So it, it's a complicated space that we're trying to navigate. Yeah, I you know I have a daughter that goes to school in in Sweeney ISD, yeah. and then I have a daughter that goes to school in in, in Angleton. They're about the same age, yeah. and the when when everything shifted online, it was vastly different. My my daughter in Angleton. You could tell Sweeney ISD was a little bit more prepared, I guess, for online learning than than AISD, um, just because of the. It's, well, it seemed like Sweeney was like overloading, just doing a bunch of content, whereas AISD was trying to get its its feet on the ground. But it caused a lot of confusion, even for parents. But you know, if you think about it, I don't think a lot of parents thought about it from that perspective. You know, we were working from home too, yeah. and it was tough on us. But, you know, you didn't really look on the other side like, well, that teacher has kids, too. And, right. you know, and then she's responsible for 30 plus kids or more, you know. And, and try teaching a five year old yeah. on, <laughs> online. Yeah. yeah, online. Try teaching a five year old uh, <laughs> online via Zoom. Oh. No dice. I mean, that, that's that, that's asking a big lift from folks that are trying to make it happen, not only at home with everything they're dealing with with COVID, but trying to navigate the system. So props and kudos to all of our teachers, K-12 and our professors at the colleges and universities, because it, this it hasn't been easy for anybody. But what we've asked an entire industry across the entire country to all of a sudden change everything that you've been doing for the last fill in the blank years. And you got to change this over, literally overnight. No, no hyperbole. There. It's like you. It was March thirteenth. I remember the date when it was it, on Monday. This is what we're doing. Yeah. I mean, it, that, that's a tough gig to 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 navigate through for anybody. And they've flipped the switch enough times to where they've they've made these systems uh, better and work because they know it's going to come around again. And they're like, yeah. we're going to be we got to be better next time, more yeah, we've efficient. Gotten better. We got to yeah, create absolutely. these things. So it's caused. The school, and I think a lot of the people at home, like the parents, didn't realize how much school was a day more like daycare. Oh yeah, they were oh, like, yeah. "Oh no, well, you know, <laughs> how am I going to watch I'm, my I'm kid? at home yeah. with the kids you again?" Know, what's yeah. crazy during this process, Mike, was uh, so when we first locked down, I'll never forget. Uh, I love watching, uh, you know, end of the world kind of movies. You know, you just <laughs> just enjoy them, right? You know, Walking Dead, those kinds of things. So I'd watch the movie Contagion a bunch of times, right? It was free. You know, you could just watch it on Netflix. Everything was cool. When we're going through this, all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, now it's for sale, right? Because everybody's watching the playbook. <laughs> and I can tell you this, that anything that's in those movies, all of that was tossed it was tossed out the window. It didn't work. There was no plans. There was, a, you know, I remember going in for a, for a COVID test when it first started. They're like, well, yeah, we can get you the test, but it's going to be about eight years before you get the results, you know? Yeah. And so it nothing worked as planned so to your point that over the last two years we've learned a lot about the process and we've gotten better and i think humanity as a whole we're, we're going to be living with this for a very long time viruses are doing what viruses do they evolve they change they mutate that's their game that's what they do so you know your kids kids john are going to be dealing with this for uh in their lives so it's about how we adapt and how we overcome the challenges created by it. But we're learning and we'll learn more tomorrow than we did yesterday. And it'll continue in that process. And we're going to get through it, but we're going to be living with this for a very long time. And there, there's no easy solution to it. Yeah. What's, um, what's the, your, your, your number one priority or what is the college priority for, for 2022? What are, what are kind of the big things yeah. you're looking at? Yeah, well, my priority is is listening and understanding. Uh, you know, being new to a place, uh, it's it's all about understanding who the players are, who are our team members. We've got some really great individuals on campus, so I want to learn how I can help them be successful. Uh, but I also want to understand the culture. I want to understand what makes the place tick in terms of the people that serve our communities. Uh, I, I've been really, really impressed over the last two weeks in terms of what I've seen. So in terms of priorities, it's all about listening and learning. I'm a big believer that uh, the, the the folks on any college campus, um, you know, Brazo uh, Brazosport College, uh, being a place where excellence is something that is expected, 
uh, it's going to be about understanding how everybody gets to that point. So that's kind of my priority at, at, at this time. And then in six months after I've learned some things, you know, things will, will, will look maybe a little bit different. Some things that we're doing. What I don't want to do is the things that we're doing really, really, really well. Uh, we're not going to mess with those. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, Brazos Sport College is an Achieving the Dream school, one of the best places in the entire country. Uh, to get an education so it's doing a lot of really great things so my my job right now is just to understand our community understand where the needs are and how i can be of service what's the uh the pre- there's no term for a Braz- for a college president right you're you're there until you 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 want to leave or something happens and yeah well day, it's right? you typically do uh, my contract is a three-year contract okay uh and then the, i serve at the at the pleasure and privilege of the board we have an elected board of officials, and uh, they are charged as elected officials with, you know, the the hiring of presidents. So I hope to be here a long time, uh, John and Mike. Uh, I'm glad to be back home in Texas. Uh, so Nevada was really, really good to me, but uh, there's nothing like being at home with, with your people in terms of family and, and, and just the communities that you grew up in. So I hope to be here a long time, but we have I have a three-year contract, and uh We'll see how it goes after I get through that process, and hopefully the board will yeah. keep me on. So they're yeah. better, right? I like you. I like you too much. I'll try to. And I'll, I'll let you a, go. Huh? I'll give him a call. I know the mayor of Lake Jackson. We'll give him a call. Yeah. <laughs> Put in a good plug. Yeah. No, but I'm. I'm really. I, I, the, the board members. The, the entire community has just been. Uh, just really fabulous in the landing. Uh, the transition's gone really well. Uh, open arms kind of a scenario. I, I couldn't be happier. I'm just glad to be back home. Well, Dr. Vincent, we've had a, a pleasure. Thank you, John. Uh, Mike. Talking with you. Um, you have any social media? Do you? Did they have you know, open accounts? Interestingly enough, uh, the only uh, social media that I got is I have a IG Instagram. Uh, okay. I do that for okay. my for my I like it. I like for it. my leather business. Uh, not business, but the leather hobbies that I have. So my, my rules are people allow ask me hey doc i need a i need a belt or a folder or a gun holster or whatever uh, so i never charge for anything i make uh and i've got some pretty nice stuff that i've learned to make over the years but i always tell whoever i'm giving something to go out and do something for a homeless person get them a meal you know we we live in the richest country on the planet i don't think anybody deserves to go without a hot meal so whatever you think my products are worth you go out and buy a couple of burgers for someone on uh, that, that that can use a that's, good meal so it's delso leatherworks and that's on instagram but that's the only social media i got john the rest of it uh i you know stay that's on awesome. social media. have you um have you heard of uh what's her last name shannon the happy bean project yeah happy bean. Ha- have you heard of the I happy bean project what that is um it's a young lady or i say young lady she's our age but she's um she's a veteran um, and she owns this nonprofit company called the Happy Bean Project, and I yeah. think it's in Lake Jackson. And what's it? Uh, oh, what, take a look at yeah, it. Yeah, what it's about is she um, everything that she collects from coffee, um, she goes and helps the the homeless in Houston. Oh, so awesome. she'll 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 take donations of uh, clothing, food, whatever. Right, and then she goes and she sets up a a, a tent and in, in Houston somewhere in Houston serves coffee, gives clothes away. Perfect, and Love she's it. out of Lake Jackson, so y'all should y'all should link up, do yeah, a little project no, together. Absolutely, yeah. I uh, I do, the other thing that if, you know somebody put in an order, uh, like I said, all my stuff is free. I never charge for it. Uh, but if they don't want to buy my meal, then they say go do some volunteer work at one of the kitchens and and help. You know, we can never stop being human. And uh, for me, that's a big part of what we do. So uh, it's not just an education piece, but uh, we're humans all the time. And uh, the world needs it. The world needs it right now. So if there's something that I can do to to make even a one day better for a, another person, uh, I'm all for that. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure. And again, thank you, John. I, I, I thank you. Great show. I wish you the best with your with your endeavor here. This is a great <laughs> yeah. setup. So I hope to come back with a different topic. Definitely. Yeah, we're going to yeah. grill you harder next we'll get time. On. Absolutely. Get this, we were soft this, this, this time. This was a soft, this yeah, was yeah. A soft just one. Okay, you, just getting you the, get the, the introduction. The yeah. Let's go. Let's get let him get a year under his belt. Yeah, let me get a year He comes out, all his hair's gone. It's almost there. So, yeah, no, I look forward to coming back. And if there's anything that we can do at Brazos Sport College uh, feel free to give us a buzz and or come by the campus I'd love for you guys to do the show from the campus one of these days That'd and be cool. uh, talk to our students uh, I'm sure that you're going to hear some amazing stories of connectivity to the community uh, how we change lives and how we work to better our 
community through this thing we call education. So uh, I'd love to have you guys on campus and talking to our students and to our teachers. Yeah, I mean, I've got we have some amazing teachers and really proud of them. So, but we also got some really amazing team members that just do a lot of different things in our community and on on the campus. So, it'd be great for you to come and get to know the team and and who makes it happen for our students. Yeah, definitely. Right. I'll, I'll probably hit you up because I'm taking some <laughs> some hard classes this year. So I'm right. tutoring. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> we got scholarships and uh, we got registration for classes going through the end of next Friday. So, hit us up and if you want to get a great education, a great place, uh, there's no better place than Brazosport College in Lake Jackson. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Awesome. Thank you. Right, guys, bye. appreciate it. Thank you.